So in any case, let's talk about, you know, so from the bigger picture, from the point of the larger conscious system, these are just experiences that we can have. So the larger consciousness system can always give you that data that corresponds to that soldier and that army and that regiment and that time, okay? And can always present that to you as your great uncle or your great, great, great grandfather or whatever, if that is of value to you in your growth process, okay? That can always be done. Things get presented to you in a way that help you grow. And even if the help is just to say, look, reality is a lot bigger, because how else would you explain this in just an objective physical reality that you can get this information and check it out? You see, that's enough to give you proof, if you will, that reality is not just physical. So these things happen. And the point is not to feel obligated to lay a, lay a uh, what an explanation, a causal explanation, Oh, here's the causal explanation. I have a lot of lives. This was a past life. So I went to my past life. I got the information and that person was my great, great grandfather, or that was me, you know, that was me uh, five lifetimes ago, that sort of thing. Okay, that's a causal ex explanation. And we tend to want causal explanations because we live in a reality full of causal explanations. So that makes us feel better. All right, now it makes sense. Okay, there are these past lives and I get that. In a bigger picture, none of that really matters. What matters is just the experience. You had the experience and what did it do for you? What could you get out of it? What did you learn from it? Maybe you only learned that reality was bigger than just a physical reality like the scientists tell you because otherwise in that reality, you couldn't get this data and check it out and find out that it was real. That would be impossible in that reality and it happened to you Therefore, you know that that reality is only partially true. There's something bigger. And maybe you found out a secret then that told you about why it is you were afraid of spiders and helped you deal with things. So when we look at it in a bigger picture, it just doesn't matter. We can make up these intellectual, uh, we can dice and slice the way we describe the larger consciousness system in such a way as to make it rational to us. Uh, causal chain of events to make that happen. But it doesn't always have to be that way. It can be that way, or it can be some other way that the larger conscious system just wanted us to have that experience. You see, so we need to be open to, yeah, that's nice. And yes, we, we do have cumulative learning because that's the only way a larger information system can learn is cumulative. So that does say that we have lifetimes. And yes, well, if there are these lifetimes, there's data of them, and it's in the database, and you can go with your intent into the database, and you can get information back. That's true. So you can intend to see, you know, your incarnation five times ago, and then you can get these images, and you can get the data, but that's all put in a, in a context that makes sense to us, that is rational. But we don't need to believe it, okay? We don't need to believe anything. I know, I'm getting kind of strange here. I'm getting, getting cause, no, I understand cause most, what you're saying. Because most people want to believe a process, a structure. They want to see the logical, causative, exactly how it can happen. Well, the structure we give it, the past lives, you know, the, the uh, larger consciousness system is a data system, and we go through all this and we can say logically how that all fits together. And then we feel, okay, that's good. We've logically explained it. But then what happens is people get that structure and now the structure itself becomes important, you see? And the structure itself is not important. That structure we make up is there because it, it makes our concepts rational. What's important is the value of the information to you. What can you take from it? What can you grow? You know, often. I talk about uh, Carlos Castaneda's books because he's just a good example. He wrote all these fantastical books about his experience with Don Juan, a uh, Mexican sorcerer and so on, and they were very popular and a lot of people seemed to get a lot from them. They kind of broadened their sense of reality, but there was this big question, was that real or was he just making it up? You see, and it doesn't matter whether that's real or he was just making it up. It only matters to a believer, to somebody who needs to believe it was true or believe it was not true. 
Did you learn anything from what he wrote? Did it give you anything that was personally valuable to you? And if the answer is yes, then did he, did he actually do it or make it up? Who cares? You got something from it. You see, you have to have the courage to decide for yourself what's valuable to you and what's not. You can't, you shouldn't go through life letting other people decide for you what's valuable to you and what's not. Oh, okay, Don Juan was a real sorcerer in Mexico and everything that he wrote, it happened, so you can believe it now. Believe everything he wrote because I'm telling you it was all true exactly the way he said it. Now you say, okay, and I'll read this and I'll believe it. Where does that get you? See, it doesn't get you anywhere. Or if I tell you, he made the whole thing up. Well, does that mean that in his mind, in his intent, went out and connected with maybe more information and he wrote it down, you know, just like when you bring up conversations with God, obviously a lot of that information is correct. It's good advice, right? Well, whether he makes it up or whether he had a conversation with God, what's, what's the point? If the information talks to you, and gives you something, then it's valuable for you. And you have to have the courage to make your own decisions about what's important and valuable to you, rather than saying, well, if somebody tells me that it's true, then I'll believe it. And if somebody tells me it's false, then I'll throw it out. You're letting somebody define your value for you. You just become one of a herd that moves when everybody else moves, instead of an individual who can actually find content and value in things that are out there. Do you know what you need, though, for this discernment to discover these things for yourself? You need a foundation, and that's why I think your books, My Big Toe, are so valuable. They're not telling you to believe anything. They are a foundation. Because I was one of those people who read Carlos Castaneda, Bob Monroe. Of course, that's very valuable. Look what he's done for the mainstream and enlightening people as to these experiences. But back in 1978, Dr. Helen Wambaugh was a psychologist and a scientist who undertook scientific recording of past life data. She took it as scientific data and what she did, she was not so much interested in the individuals recalling their lives or the details about it, she was interested in, is this real and how historically correct it is? Mm -hmm. And I was back in one of her classes in 78, and I saw two lifetimes, and I thought to myself, it was valuable to her because she's collecting data as to details, as to historical, as to male-female population. She did it that way in that kind of, does this add up? Do these people's recollections add up to correct data that matches our historical database, right? Mm -hmm. I saw two lifetimes and I go, that's nice. And most of the things I read were very interesting. Uh, Seth speaks, mm -hmm. this seemed real. These things touched me. Bob's books, real. You know, Helen Wamba. Was that recollection real? Well, I, it took me 30 years to find out when I read your My Big Toe books, I had a foundation and a big picture and everything flooded back in and I was able to reconnect with those two lifetimes in far more detail. So what I was seeking back 30 years ago and what I was doing, reading and reading and looking and testing, always looking for the bigger picture, wasn't actualized until I came across your books. And I think whatever that experience is for me, those two lifetimes came back and I saw them in more detail and they meant something then because of the structure and the foundation you gave in your books. So that is not significant really to anybody except on an individual basis. You know, so, what is it to me? Someone might, well, tell me about the story. Well, who were you? Well, what did you do? Well, I could. And it might be of use in some sort of form or another, but the real value is taking your idea of the bigger picture and finding your own. 
big deal. Yeah. Finding your own, your own answers. Yeah. You are the world's greatest expert on what's valuable to you. Mm. You see, and if you can't, if you can't figure that out, well, nobody else is going to be able to tell you what's valuable to you. But most of us go through life expecting other people to tell us what to believe and what not to believe. You see, okay, I had a past life. I only, I had a dream last night. And in that dream, I went through, you know, past life and I was this and that and the other. But is it true? Well, you see, it's a wrong question. Stop asking, is it true? Was it valuable? What did you get out of it? Was there anything there significant? If the answer is, well, no, there really wasn't anything significant. It was just a picture. Well, then, what was the point? You see, there's not much point to it at that point. It's just like, well, you, you know, it's neither here nor there. Maybe I need to revisit it four or five or six more times and see if there is a point. And if there's never a point, then go on, do something else. But we need to understand that we have to find value in our experience. And I assure everybody out there reading this, there is much, much value in your experience. Mostly, we just ignore it and go on by. We don't see it. And we have this, this problem with, with proof. It's not about proof. That's not the point. Consciousness is subjective. You have a consciousness, you know. Nobody else knows what's in your consciousness, what's in your mind. Only you are inside your head. So your perceptions are inside your head. This data stream comes to you. You know, we say inside your head. Not really. It comes through consciousness to your free will awareness unit, okay? But you imagine that it's inside your physical head in your brain. So in your head is just another metaphor. So you have, you as an individual have to interpret all the data you get. You have to make something of it. And only you are the judge of, of whether that's valuable or not valuable to you. It's not whether or not, you know, there's been some scientific proof of it. Scientists only deal with that little piece of reality that's called objective causal. That's a subset. That's a small subset of reality. Within that subset, then the laws of objective causality hold. That's in an area, that subset is defined where natural uncertainty of things is small. You know, you drop a rock, how fast will it fall? Well, we know that to, you know, 20 decimal places until we take in air friction and currents and the fact that the earth isn't really spherical and you know the pool of other bodies and suddenly in the 25th and 30th decimal places it's there's uncertainty so the uncertainty is small but in those areas then we could say that objective causality holds just like newtonian physics holds in those areas where we're in the macro world and we're not going at relativistic speeds then newtonian physics holds in that subset and Newtonian physics is only an approximation, but it holds reasonably well. The approximation is good within that subset. Well, objective reality is only an approximation, but it's a pretty good approximation within that subset where natural uncertainty is small. But there's so much more than that little objective reality subset. There's all the subjective reality. Your awareness, your interpretation of the data that you get that has nothing to do with that. Plus there's, you know, the soft sciences where they have more uncertainty. You know, and the hard sciences don't even claim the soft sciences as science. You know, these are things like, uh, you know, economics, psychology, uh, sociology, all the soft science dealing with people. And people are uncertain because much of what they do is not objective, it's subjective, which creates a lot of uncertainty. So the soft sciences have to use double and triple blind in order to eliminate some of those variables because we change things with our intent. And those variables are kind of like wild, wild variables. So there's more uncertainty. It's not really hard science. And then you go into even softer things where, there, where it's almost all uncertainty, like your dreams, okay? Your past lives and other things. These are data that you get. Well, if you, have an experience that tells you that, okay, you had this, this past life dream, you checked the data, and the data 
was verified historically, or like this lady did, who did a research and she find, well, are the things that people are telling her, do they fit the historical database, or are they outside of the historical database? And she found they fit the historical database. Well, it's maybe just because her subjects kind of had grown up inside of a description of a historical database, so they made things up that were in the historical database, but probably not. She got more specific than, oh yes, I'm in a place and there's air and there's trees and there's ground underneath my feet. Oh, well, that's historical. See, that's not what was going on. It was specific places and people and things and events that could then be checked to see if they were within the historical database. Those kinds of things then tell you that they're getting this information some other way, okay? But that's enough. They're getting it in some other way is all you need to know to realize that reality is larger than this little physical objective causal reality. Now once you've established that, that it's bigger than that and causal reality, the subjective universe, is just a subset. All right, you've learned that lesson. Now what? Now what else is out there? What does it mean? You see, then you, you start to look for more, become a seeker once you realize. If you've never had that experience and don't know of anybody you trust who had that experience, well, you can go read books. You know, go pick up a book uh, by you know, Dean Radin. He's done research on all of these things for years and years and years, and he's a hard-nosed researcher who you know, needs evidence to be you know, to be very, uh, very solid. And Dean will tell you it's not about proof, it's about evidence. You know, you collect the evidence, and if the evidence is real, then you have to accept that it's real. You know, it's not, yeah, it's not about some theoretical concept of proof. That's not really what's going on. It's about an actual understanding of evidence. And sometimes the evidence is only for you because you can say, okay, I had, the, I had the experience. I checked on the data from the past life. It was correct. It was soldier, you know, Joe, Joe Schmo from that regiment at that time, at that place. And I, you know, I can't deny it because it was my experience. But you go tell somebody else, you can say, oh, guess what? You know, I had this experience and I did this and I found it out and I went and I checked it out and it was real. And they go, yeah, right. You say, so do you have proof? No, not for anybody but yourself. So mostly what proof is about is about your own proof because the process itself has to do with consciousness which is subjective and subject to your own interpretation and you know, you're not going to prove objectively that you had this experience and looked up the data and, and uh, you know, it was right. That's not that sort of thing. Because even if you got a bunch of people around you and you laid down and you came up and you said, okay, here, I've got this data. And they wrote it all down and they checked it and they said, oh yeah, okay, this is the data and it matches. Did that prove anything? No, it didn't prove anything. All it proved is you looked that data up ahead of time, right? And then you said it. Or you and the, and the uh, other experimenters are all in cahoots somehow. See, there's always some deniability from people who aren't involved with it personally. So you take the people who are outside, and even if your science had perfect, you know, let's say a remote viewing experiment, it has perfect protocol. Somebody walks in and hands you an envelope, or, and you never open it, or shows you an envelope and says, there's a target in here, go tell me what's there and that it was double and triple blind to somebody had put a thousand targets together. They were randomly put in envelopes by a different person. Then a third different person shuffled the envelopes and now they give you one and you have no idea. You could guess it was one of the thousand, but that's about as close as you could guess. And your person has never seen the thousand. They don't even know that it's one of a thousand or they've never even looked and you've never seen the thousand. Neither did the other person. So this is good scientific protocol. So you've got, you know, like, like a triple barrier for whatever, and you hand that person, and they look at a remote view, and they describe the scene, and it's accurate. Well, is that proof? It's not proof for anybody other than that remote viewer and the people who are involved in it, because they know the procedure. You go outside and say, well, we have this remote viewing thing. You know, that proves this, and they'll say, no, it doesn't prove anything to me. It proves those guys are all nuts. They're all in cahoots. They're making all this stuff up. 
they have lousy scientific protocol, and this person says that, they don't know whether that's true or not, but they assume it must be true, right? Because otherwise this is impossible. So it doesn't prove anything. This idea that you can do an experiment, prove it, and after that everybody will have to, you know, believe it and agree with it, you know, that's foolish. It's not about proof. It's about experience. What does it mean to you? What value do you have in it? And the value may be just that you realize reality is bigger than that small subset called objective, you know, causality that our science sees as the only reality there is. You know, they're stuck in a, in a subset. Well, in Newton's time, Newtonian reality was the only reality there was, and anything else would have been silly and absurd. And if you go before Newtonian, well, they had their own reality vision. You know, the flat earth, anything other than a flat earth was absurd. If the earth was round, everything would fall off the other side. You know, it was a ridiculous idea. The oceans would run off, you know, around the sides. And uh, you couldn't have an ocean if the earth was round because the oceans would run off and then spill off the sides. They had no concept of gravity. So, you know, that's the nature of things. So when people are constantly want proof, well, that's because they need a belief to erase the fear that they don't know. So they have an assumption, I know, I know everything. Look, reality is just this, it's nothing more than this, and that's all, I'm done. If you have any idea or any statement outside of that, you're wrong, your methods were sloppy, da 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 Well, they're afraid to be open to actually look at things because they have this belief, and the belief answers all their questions, and they're done now, they don't have to think anymore. That's the problem, you say, with the value. Or if you believe that Castaneda made it all up, therefore his book is useless, you say, then you miss out on some very interesting things he talked about and uh, concepts that he brought up. You see? So if he made them all up, but you learn something from them that's valuable to you and helps you evolve and helps you see a bigger picture that's useful to you, does it matter whether he got that out of his imagination, or maybe from the same place that Neil Donald Walsh got his conversation with God, or the place that any number of scientists and others get kind of intuition, kind of comes down and, aha, I got the solution. This is how it works. Well, are those ahas all wrong? You know, do they, do they never contribute? No, they can contribute just as well. How about fiction? Can you read a work of fiction and get something out of it and learn something? about the way the characters interact and the things that happen, and you can look at that and you can say, oh, I kind of see myself in that. That's a bigger picture. I didn't realize that. You can learn from it. You can learn from all sorts of things. That brings me to my next question for you, or a next discussion, really. MBT is about, this is a subjective, informational reality, but we have collective interactions within that. We have our own interpretations. This is where I think, because of culture and beliefs and traditions, when they're on the highest level, everyone's viewpoint has a value. Where it seems to go wrong is where they think what they have seen and experienced is the only thing, and anything outside of that needs to be, they need to be at war with it, or they need to fight it, I think that's what has happened throughout history. They need to keep control and power over it. There's fear, there's ego, there's high entropy. Can you comment on that in general, you know, throughout sure. history, how that has yeah. been? And a good segue with what we're talking about to kind of lead into this, because what you're talking about is how the intellect begins to, uh, if you will, believe in itself and that uh, its experience is the only right experience. The, the intellect can be a wonderful tool, and the intellect can help us, it can guide us, it can help us focus on the stuff that's important and things that's not important. It can understand big pictures, and therefore kind of understand how we best need to act, uh, how it is we evolve, all these things the intellect can understand. But if it never gets out of the intellect, then it'll never get very far. And you're talking about people who, who have experiences and valuable, meaningful experiences. 
But then the intellect gets involved and pretty soon their experiences are the right experiences, the right way to go, you know, and others then are wrong and it becomes ego and intellect rather than learning. It's a matter of, of taking your information and getting it in a little picture where it's you know, confined by your own beliefs and understandings or getting in a bigger picture where you see it as just a piece of something bigger. We were just talking about the, the past life things and there are people who, you know, I get letters all the time that says, can you help me get out of body? Can you help me see past lives? I really need to go back and you know, do this past life thing and I want to be, get into the future probable database and can you help me do these things? Well, you see, they're concerned with the doing. They're concerned with, I want to do this. I want to get in the past life. And if you approach it from a chasing the goal or chasing the phenomena, it's the wrong way to do it. You know, that's not the right thing. If they say, well, I'd like to know more about why I'm afraid of spiders. Well, go on into your mind go back to that state, you know, or open your mind for information. Does it matter whether it comes in a past life, in a piece of intuition, in a, however it matters. Don't frame the picture, you know, in a process first and then try to come to a goal. Open yourself and take it however it comes in whatever process it takes. And if it does take a past life, then don't say, well, that's it, past lives are true and anybody who thinks anything different, you know, doesn't understand. We have to use our intellects to give us guidance, but the intellect cannot really take us very far. It can point a direction, and that's what the intellect says. The intellect says, well, I've looked at everything, I've considered all the data, and I think it would be best to move in this direction, to learn this, to become that. Now, the intellect can do that, but then we have to go do it and learn that and become that. We can't, we can't uh, read about it and learn it. What's important in, in uh, evolving is getting something at the being level, changing your being, becoming love, letting go of fear and ego, belief. If you can make that change, it has to be a change at the being level. It's not a change at the intellectual level. You can't intellectually say, well, all right, now I don't believe anything and I'm not afraid of anything and, uh, you know, it's about other, not about me. All right, I'm done. I'm perfect now you know, because you've intellectually decided that's the way you're going to be. That's not it. How you act is not necessarily how you are. So here we have lots of people who have seen and known wonderful pieces of information. They've intuited however you want to say it. And they are, you know, correct, or at least partially correct. They've got some piece of the big picture. But if they take that piece of the big picture and turn it into dogma and, and uh, define it as you know, the right way and the only way, then they've, they've taken something wonderful and created something not so good with it. You see, if they just left it what it was, then a lot of people maybe could have taken it, seen it a little differently because they get the data different. Every time you get data, it's filtered by your own fears, beliefs, culture. You know, when I say beliefs, uh, that takes in culture. You know, we have cultural beliefs and personal beliefs, scientific beliefs. All these beliefs then lead us to put it into certain metaphors. And then those metaphors we mistake for truth. They're just our metaphor for the information we got. And those metaphors reflect us in our culture. So we have that a lot. You know, that's what, that's what differentiates most of the larger religions of the world, is their metaphors. The big differences between them isn't their theology so much. It's the dogma. It's the metaphors. It's how they express that theology. You know, that comes down to the fundamental differences. And because of those metaphors, and because of that dogma, you know, they want to kill each other, or, or at least they brush each other off as not being significant. 
oh yeah, there are other religions, but they're not right. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. They're this or they're that. And, oh, you have these these uh, shaman who you know have wolf gods or the gods of the woods and the spirits of the mountains or the trees and things. You know, that's all you know primitive. Blah blah. You know, that couldn't have any meaning and so on. And that's a closed-minded approach. It has great meaning in that culture, in that from that point of view, from that perspective, you see. Outside of that perspective and culture, the metaphors kind of get lost. They don't mean the same things, and they're hard to understand. So, yes, that happens a whole lot. We, we get information. We uh, find out that it works, and it's valuable to us, and then it becomes the one and only truth. Whereas we need to say, this information we got is just a piece of the bigger picture. We probably didn't get all the information. We probably just got a piece of the larger picture. Well, let it stay out there in the larger picture and share it out there. Don't bring it in, personalize it, filter it, get a whole bunch of people to agree with you, then take up a collection every Sunday, you know, then uh, build buildings and have infrastructure and high muftis and, you know, priests and whatever to regulate the thought. So suddenly you've walked away from the, you've, you've walked away from what's valuable in it and becomes the, the dogma, becomes the valuable thing. And if course, you're gathering people together in an organization, I think there's value there for a community to gather people together if they have the big truth in, in, in mind. But oftentimes they take bits of the truth and isolate themselves with it. And that's when it becomes unhelpful. It becomes a separateness. And any time we try to separate ourselves, as you have pointed out in some of your lectures, you show your famous consciousness group of all of these little faces, but they're not really separate. Anytime we try to separate ourselves, label ourselves, call ourselves, you know, one label after another, we cut ourselves off from that big picture message. Well, consciousness is individual. You see, what really matters most to your evolution of your consciousness is just internal to you. So now we can share some things. We just need not to make more of them than they are. They're tools. And one of the things I talk about a lot because it's such a well-known tool and a good tool are chakras. Okay, now that comes out of the Hindu tradition. And they, you know, and it was, you know, you can think some tools are, are very clever tools and they're very useful tools, but they're just tools. So the chakras are very useful tools because they take spiritual concepts, if you will. They take big picture ideas and they make them body centered. So you have seven chakras, each with a part of the body. Okay, so now you've taken something that's non-physical and and very abstract, and you've made a physical interface for it. Well, that's a handy tool because everybody then can kind of relate to the, to the body instead of the, the more um, abstract relation to the, you know, to the, the larger system. So now people, you, know, you have this chakra and it covers certain things, you know, and it's certain physical, and, you know, it's in this physical place and it does these physical things, but it also does these non-physical and other attributes and you can concentrate on this with your mind and you can open that chakra. And we've got all this stuff and we have meditations to open chakras and, and all of that is just a structure. There's nothing fundamental about chakras. It's just a structure that's been built up to allow people to focus their intent on doing specific things and, and specific kinds of knowledge and connecting them. And it's done it in a way that it's made a physical interface as these things are stuck in the physical body. Well, look, the physical body doesn't even exist. There is no physical body. It's just information, you know? It's a set of constraints, if you will, on a data stream. That's all it is. So the fact that you have a heart chakra and the one at the solar plexus and the root chakra and the crown chakra and all these, 
and they all have different aspects, that's a nice way to break things up, to define them, to produce process for energizing and getting, for making tools so that people know that if you do this, you'll get that. Well, then that gives them confidence that if they put their intent in a particular way, they can get certain kinds of information and connection and see the picture that's bigger. And it's a very useful set of tools. It's just tools. It's just a tool set. It's a, we, somebody could have figured, you know, could have done something else that would have worked just as well. You know, it, uh, you know, the body was handy because everybody has one, right? So it's personal. Well, that's nice. So that was a good, that was a clever part of the tool. But the tools aren't fundamental. But now you'll find that in the Hindu religion, a lot of people would be jumping up and down thinking that, you know, Tom Campbell, and what the hell he's talking about because the chakras are real and they're fundamental. And I, I know. see them. Yes, well, I know so. I can see them too. You see, I, <laughs> yes. I, I've seen, you know, I've been <laughs> able to see ours for, you know, for close to 40 years. <laughs> Yeah, I can see them too, but that's just information. Well, that's collective information, though, because I know a very uh, talented healer, and, and of course you you also. I mean, this is collective information because someone will say, uh, oh my goodness, your heart chakra is it's mm -hmm. green and it's huge, and I can see that. So this information or this tool is shared collectively, and it is real in that sense. So you're not saying that it isn't real. No, no, it's, it's, not, simply, it's not that it isn't real. You know, what's real? You know, we have this idea of what's real and what's not real. That's sort of like what you can prove and what you can't prove. It's the wrong idea, you know. Is it useful? Well, chakras are useful because they're a useful tool. People heal with light beams. You know, I'm a light worker, right? They'll say, and I'll put a beam of white light on your bad spot there and I'll heal it. it there is no light. Light's just a metaphor. There's no such thing as light. There's no such thing as energy. Energy is just a metaphor. Well, I'm going to give you good energy. It's just a metaphor. It's a way we think about things so that we can get our abstract things down to a more concrete level so that we can interact with them. Uh, it's, it's information. It's data. You're influencing the data field, if you will. You're modifying the information with your intent. You're querying data and getting information back in a certain format. Okay, well, we mostly see auras as pictures, right? We see them as kind of globs of color with different meanings to the different colors and so on. And we share information, so what you're saying that it's collective information. You know, when I read C.W. Ledbetter, okay, a theosophist, wrote a book called Man Visible and Invisible. And that was a book about auras. And he talked all about the auras, and he had probably 50 color pages of auras. And you could see what the colors meant, and he'd say, here's a picture of somebody angry. And he'd, he'd have an aura, and here was the anger. And here's a picture of somebody falling in love. And here's a picture, so you get to see all these pictures. And here's a picture of a highly evolved being. And here's a picture of a lowly evolved being. And he had all these pictures and colors and things, and explained to you what they meant. Here's somebody telling a lie. You could see it. Okay, well, when it comes time to interpret the data, how am I going to interpret the data? I'm going to interpret the data like C.W. Ledbetter did, because he's told me that when somebody's angry, you get big red zigzags coming around. So if I'm looking at, at the data, I'm going into the database, basically, and I say, I want to, I want to see data that tells me about the emotional being of, of Donna. Okay? So then the, the system says, well, how do you want the data displayed? You know, I just can't say I want data. You know, how do you want the data displayed? If you date it with Google, you want it displayed on your monitor, right? In words, in words of your language. Say for us, English words is how you want to display. Well, if you're getting data about Donna's emotional state or emotional being or spiritual being or health, you know, being whatever, you know, etheric. So if you want to get that kind of data, then the system wants to know how to display it. What do you want? And if your thing is, well, I want a picture, like Ledbetter's, you know, I want, you know, the red means this, and you know, to display it in a, me that, in a way that I can interpret it, then that's what I'll get. So I will have Ledbetter's interpretation will become my interpretation because I read it, and to me that was the, that was the way you'd see it. Well, after doing experimentation, I found out that you could make up your own output format. You could say, oh, I'd rather have, you know, if somebody's angry, I'd like to see purple polka dots you know, on a, you know, on a green surface or something. Well, if that's your intent, 
for your output format, that's what you'll get. When you're looking at healing, instead of saying, I want the things that are not healthy to be black and the things that are healthy to be white, you can turn that around and say, I want the things that are unhealthy to be a white. Oh, some dirty, nasty white, you know, and I want the stuff that's really healthy to be a shiny, bright black. And you can see it that way. And I want to shine a, you know, a light beam on the, on the unhealthy stuff. Well, it's hard to visualize a black beam getting rid of light, you see, because we can't see a black beam. We see light, you see, black is the absence of. So we use light beams because that makes more sense. And we have cultural beliefs about white and dark. You know, the good cowboys wear the white hats. The bad cowboys wear the black hats. You see, light and black means different things to us. We attach cultural value to stuff like that. And that's what we get in our pictures. You know, that's what we get in our, from our database, from our own, you know, output format that we defend. So yes, we have these cultural things. So if the idea of chakras now is widely known, and it's a, it's a good tool set that uses the body because everybody has one, but it helps people focus their intent on certain kinds of information is all that's going on there. You've just now learned a process that instead of using a light beam to get rid of the dark bad stuff, you see that the root chakra controls certain things. So when you want to think about in terms of those things, then you focus your mind in terms of a root chakra, which is easy because it's part of a physical body, which is something familiar to you, rather than just talking about, well, there are these aspects to your larger system and some of them are like this and some of them are like those and you can see that's very that's very uh, abstract and hard for people to deal with it's much better to say when you have this case you know this and it's attached here well you know again there is no physical body there, there is no you know there, there's nothing there but information and that information is evolved and it serves as a constraint on a free will awareness unit. We discussed that about that earlier. That's all that's going on there. Nothing, no magic in the body. The body doesn't exist. There is no physical reality. It's all information. So we have these tools like light beams to heal, like auras that we can see. But we do, in a, as a group, kind of agree on how we should see them. And then that makes us all feel that we're right because I see the same thing Ledbetter saw. So I must be doing it right because he was, you know, he was really good at this. And if I see the same thing he sees, then I'm good at it too. So it's that kind of thing. It gives us consistency. We don't like to just, see, if we, if we didn't have to worry about others telling us that we're okay, telling us that we're right, we wouldn't need that. We could just get the information, put it in our own output format, and work with it and do very well with it. But right away it's, well, is that right or is that not right? Well, I need somebody else to tell me whether I'm right or not. I can't tell whether this is useful for me. Well, you should be able to tell. Work with it. Use it. Heal with it. Grow your you know, spiritual self with it. Uh, look for information. And if it works, it's good. The fact that it is different from somebody else's, well, I must be doing it wrong. You know, because I didn't get that. You see, that's just limiting. What happens is we, we are so fearful that we have to get other people to tell us that we're okay, that we're not doing it wrong. And we can't develop our own tools. We need somebody else to tell us the tools that we should use. Well, any religion will give you a set of tools. You know, whether you get stars of David or crosses or whatever else, and you get, you know, prayer beads or you get, you know, other kinds of special prayers to say, you know, these are all tool sets to help focus your mind. So everybody can give you a set of tools and people that use that tool set then have a name, you know, they're, they're Hindu because, you know, in the Hindu uh, cosmology, chakras are a reality. Well, chakras are a common tool, that's all. And other people have found that the tool is handy. They can better work with with more abstract things by using this sort of concrete interface, if you will, with the more abstract world. So they like the idea of chakras too, and they're kind of handy things. 
So it spreads. It's not just the Hindus that look, you know, everybody's, you know, chakras are almost mainstream uh, reality now, right? And that wasn't true 60 or 70 years ago. If you weren't familiar with Hindu theology, you'd say, chakra, what's that? A new kind of sandwich, you know? They would not have had any idea, but that's not true now. It's become pervasive. So those are pervasive tools. The people who do Reiki healing have their own tool sets, their own set of symbols. None of those symbols are fundamental, although many Reiki people might think that they are. They're just convenient. They're helpful. They are make people feel good that they have a common way of doing things, because if it's common, then it must be true if other people get it. So yes, culturally we have these ideas and the ideas kind of spread because we're all netted. Every individual unit of consciousness, every free will awareness unit that's playing in this virtual reality that we think is our physical universe, they're all netted. So ideas kind of move around. Concepts, that's how fads, fads will spread that way. Lots of things, lots of ideas spread that way. It's the hundredth monkey concept that we, you know, information kind of spreads around more than just I tell you and you tell somebody else and we all see it on television. We've got that in common in our culture, but besides that, if a whole lot of people get excited about this and I kind of worked up and they had a lot of energy, again, another metaphor, you know, about this, other people will tend to, oh, look at that, what's going on there, what's that? It'll draw attention and it shares on a non-physical level. We get this this crosstalk, if you will. So that's how we end up with cultures. You know, if a culture was just on memorized information, it would fall apart. It's on a shared sense of reality that we all share on a nonverbal level. It doesn't fall apart. Cultural things will grab very tightly. Some of the things we do, the only reason we do them is because that's what we've done for the last 200 years. Well, that's why we do it. I mean, why does anybody build a frame house out of two by fours and plywood? You know, well, because that's the way we made houses 500 years ago. We used sticks of wood and whatever to make, to make houses. Well, now we have materials, we have resins, we have all kinds of things that could be used in building trades, but we make houses just like we did 200 years ago because that's what we do, you see. It doesn't matter that there are new things. You know, there's this thing that went around uh, a long time ago. That, you know, you look at the big rocket, the Saturn rocket, and it has a certain diameter and a certain height and a certain weight, and all those things are very important about the design. If it was taller, the design would have to be different. If it was fatter, the design would have to be different. You know, you take all these things and you say, well, how is it that we got this design for the Saturn rocket to be just as high, just this big round, you know, just this, this kind of weight? Well, the Saturn rocket has to travel from a place in Utah to a place at Cape Kennedy and it has to go through a tunnel. So it can't be any bigger than the size of the tunnel. Well, the tunnel is the size that it is because of the distance in the railroad tracks. Well, the railroad tracks came from the very first trains who were, put, who were made from wagon chassis. And the wagon chassis were made to fit two horses. So the reason that Saturn rocket is the diameter that it's in, which forces the height to be a certain thing for efficiency, is because of how wide the backsides of two horses are standing together. So that's why that rocket is that size, because that's the size that fit on the track, that fit through the channel, that whatever goes back to Romans with horses pulling chariots, you see? So that's how, the, that's how it goes. So that rocket couldn't be any fatter, even if fatter was more you know, optimal. It couldn't be any other. So it is what it is because of you know, something that happened 2,000 years ago 3,000 years ago. And why were the wagons all made that way? Because they had to fit where, you know, because you had all these ruts that made the roads. And if your wheels were bigger or smaller, you were constantly one, one wheel in a rut, and one knot, and it was trouble. So everybody had to make them the same size. And so it, it had to do with, with horses. They were made to fit a certain wheelbase. So you look at a railroad track, 
that's about where the wheels need to be if you pull a horse in Rome. Interesting. Not because, and you wonder too, because those tracks are so narrow and those trains are so tall with so much mass and they go around corners too fast and they fall over. Why wouldn't you have a track that was 10 feet wide, you see? Well, they are what they are because of the history where they come from. If somebody just today came up with the idea with a, with a train, it wouldn't be on a track that was you know, four feet wide. It would be on a track that was maybe eight feet wide. They wouldn't fall over so often. You know, they'd give it a wider wheelbase. They could go faster. And engines measured in horsepower. Yeah, you're right. Engines are measured in horsepower, right, so today. So an awful lot of what we have and the way we see the world is just has to do with what we're familiar with and history and where it comes from. And these cultural things are embedded in our consciousness as well as embedded in our intellects. Well, because the individual perspective or the individual interpretation is so powerful in some individuals, you can see how their experience, if told, is taken literally by people as something to believe in. And I think that's where we go wrong. There's nothing wrong with any of the basic concepts of the great religions, except when they expect you to give up your individual power. Well, except when it gets to dogma, except when it gets to belief. Belief is the enemy. You know, fear is the enemy. Belief is, is uh, more often than not created by fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of not knowing, fear of being wrong. So, yes, groups aren't inherently bad. Groups that have beliefs and constraints about the way things have to be and what their members have to think are limiting, obviously. But why do we have those? You say, well, people could form groups just as long as they don't get into uh, my way is better than your way, and if you want to join my group, you have to think the way I think, you know, this sort of thing. But that doesn't happen. All the groups that have any size and power by stint of the size of their membership, say, they're all limited. They all say you have to believe what I believe, think what I think, because that's the way we are. So we as human beings are at a level of our evolution and consciousness in that fear, ego, and belief make up you know, 90% of who we are. Well, our job is to get rid of that and have it make up none of how we are, but it makes up most of what we are. Most people make choices based on fear, belief, expectation, ego. That's why we do the things we do. That's why we react the way we are. That's why we buy the cars that we buy. That's why we do most everything we do is based on fear, ego, expectations, belief. And that's how we are. So when somebody has some inspiration, has an idea, ends up with a very nice tool set like chakras or like, uh, you know, the, uh, the symbols that you get in Reiki or like, you know, we can name a half a dozen other kind of sets of healing modalities and things that go through different, you know, processes. They find something that works. The only active ingredient is consciousness. It's conscious intent. That's the only active ingredient. The tool set makes it easier or harder for people to focus that intent. So there's, there's only one active ingredient. This is a, you know, this is a virtual reality based in a consciousness system. So consciousness and conscious intent is the active ingredient. The rest of it are props and tools and stories and cultures that help us focus that intent in certain ways. But that's what they are. And if we see that bigger picture, then it's easy not to be trapped in those beliefs. It's also, you know, that you, you shouldn't, you know, talk down or, or uh, you know, well, those people are stupid because they believe all that stuff, you know. Well, that's just ego talking. They are as they are. They're doing what, the best they can with what they've got. They start from where you start and you struggle from that point on. So it's not that all these things are wrong and, and stupid and everybody that does them or is wrong or stupid, then that just puts us in the same boat as everyone else. 
You see, people are just the way they are. They are just who they are. They're struggling from wherever they are. This is a this is a daycare. This is not a graduate school. You know, so you can't go in and say, well, look at all these children in the daycare. Look at them. They're grabbing toys from each other. They're screaming because they don't get their way. What is it with these kids? Boy, these are awful kids. No, they're not awful kids. It's just the way they are. They're at that point where that's what they do. And you deal with it in a way that's profitable to you. So that's kind of the way you need to look at it, look at it here. Everybody's doing the best they can with what they've got. And some people are uh, full of uh, fear and ego and full of dogma and they know the answer and you're stupid if you, know, you don't agree with them. But uh, they'll grow up one day, at least we hope. We've been given on this earth a lot of uh, evolved beings who've come here to help, such as you know, various prophets, the Buddha, and various others. Do those beings return? They've come with a, a universal message, and I don't think they would give up necessarily on earth. Would they return and try to put out the same information in a modern context? Okay, well that takes us back to our, uh, our idea of free will awareness units and individual units of consciousness. Well, they return. Who's they? If they is the, the physical uh, being that they once were, you know, the, the fat guy with the bald head, you know, bald head, and that was Buddha, right? And, uh, well, another fat guy with a bald head return, you know, probably not, you see. So, no, in that sense, the Buddha as a physical person doesn't. But does energy come here and come here again to help the rest of us get a bigger picture? Well, sure, that, that happens. There's all sorts of things that happen for our education, for our benefit. The system is evolving in part because we're evolving, because we're part of the system. So the system wants us to succeed in this evolution. So it tries to create, uh, it tries to create environments and situations that help us out. Okay, one of those things is this virtual reality we're in. Okay, that's a, that's a way to help us evolve more effectively. So the system provides that. We get nudges, we get inspiration, we get ideas, we get feelings, we have things happen to us. We'll have, uh, you know, we'll get, we'll get some data that we couldn't get in any normal way. So we call that paranormal, but basically it's just the system helping us see a bigger picture. So we get lots of help to see the bigger picture if we're ready to receive it. So yes, we'll have entities will come back who will be good examples of, you know, living life to become love. You know, they're, they're good examples of that. And those people change things, you know. Some of them become known worldwide, like a, you know, like a Gandhi, right? Like a Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, you know, who achieved what you could only say were miraculous achievements in their time. You know, changing whole cultures, chasing out armies that were hundred times stronger than they were. You know, they did things that were kind of miraculous because they were great people with depth. And yes, this kind of energy does come back here because that's just one more way that the system can help us, you know, grow up. This school is, is really trying to teach us. You know, it's not just a sink or swim. You're in this school, you know, you're on your own, you know, evolve or die. The, the system really is trying to make it as easy and as effective as it can, but it can't give us the answers or we don't learn anything. That potential that we were talking about before that exists as information of beings of quality, highly evolved beings, that potential comes back as another being at that stage, at that quality, Mm -hmm. and tries to do the sure. same thing. Sure. Whether we recognize yeah. them You always <laughs> come back at the quality that you've earned to that point. So if you are, if you are a being that's evolved quite a bit and you have grown up a lot, whenever you come back, 
that's how you come back. It's that kind of a being is the potential you start with. Now you could actually make some real bad decisions and not, you know, not do as well next time as you did last time because you have free will. It's not a guarantee, but the probability is that you'll do very well and you will be a good example. You will be uh, someone other people look up to and you may just be, you know, the little old lady that lives on the corner that's just so sweet and gives all the children, you know, kind words and so on and she volunteers and it may just be that person who history doesn't even remember existed but who affected hundreds of lives. It may just be at that level. It doesn't have to be, you know, Gandhi or Martin Luther King. You know, it could just it could be a Mother Teresa, you know, that somebody works with poor people, not a political, you know, the other two were doing political things. It could be somebody that just shows kindness. And it could be somebody that history never records, you know, but they make an important statement in people's lives. And they help, and even if they only make a really important statement in 10 people's lives, they could change somebody's outlook entirely and help that person make good decisions where otherwise they'd make poor decisions. Well, then that's valuable. So we all have the potential to be that person. You see, we all have the potential to be good examples and to help people see bigger pictures and to let go of the fear and the I know and you don't, you know, the ego and the beliefs and the expectations. We can all do that. And if we do that to any, you know, just as a good example, we will be effective in changing the world. That's how you change the world. It doesn't change because Buddha arrives. You know, that helps. Suddenly, you know, there's 100,000, a million people who over centuries and centuries and centuries kind of have this bigger picture offered to them as a possibility. So that's helpful. But that's still here. You know, the Buddha's message, you know, Christ's message, Muhammad's message, uh, you know, they're all, Martin Luther King's message, Gandhi's message, you know, all of these messages are still here. It's not like the message has gone away. A lot of dogma has grown up around it. So you'll have Buddhists and Hindus who are all wrapped up in their dogma, just like you'll have Christians and Muslims that are all wrapped up in their dogma. You know, you have that. So some of it just kind of stalls out and doesn't go much, but still the concepts, the ideas are all still there. So these people, when they, when they leave, it's not like they've never been there. Those kinds of things go on forever. You know, it's, that's one, it's kind of an example. You can say, well, you know, look at a, we'll just look at a Martin Luther King, because here we are in America and we're Americans. So he's kind of, you know, a little more at home than a, than a Gandhi, you know, but uh, he changed our culture rather dramatically. He was remarkable. So. Look at his legacy. So now he's been dead for decades. And even if we go, you know, decades from now, the changes that he created are still growing, still evolving, still becoming. You know, it wasn't a change in, in stuff or structure. It eventually became some of that. We changed some laws. We changed some, some you know, some structure in our society because of it. We changed the way we did things to some extent. You know, we got rid of the, you know, the black bathroom and the white bathroom and the, the black lunch counter and the white lunch counter. You know, we changed some of the stuff, and that's good. The stuff needed to change, but what really changed is attitude. You know, what really changed was at the level of being and the level of consciousness, and that just keeps going on. That keeps expanding. So that's a. That's a, uh, what do we call it? You, know, you can think of like an expanding cloud of, of positiveness, of goodness. That's still expanding. It's still there growing. Take that, we're talking about people who have big impacts. And take something that was awful. Take some warlord someplace. Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, you know, whatever. There's been all kinds of local warlords that have uh, created mayhem and havoc and death and destruction locally. And all of them, all of their heritage and all of the sum of what is still progressing from them today is almost nothing. You see, it's almost as if they hadn't existed. Our life would be significantly different. You know, it doesn't have a long-term effect, whereas a Gandhi, hmm. whereas, uh, you know, the, the, the turn away from apartheid, you know, in South Africa with Mandela, 
those are things that will continue to grow and affect people for you know hundreds of hundreds of years. They're not sh they're not just flashes in the pan. So that's what you know. People will still talk about Mother Teresa a hundred years from now. She will still be a name that's known because she was a an example. So these are people who are truly powerful, who make marks in the world that persist, not the not the thugs and the dictators. They come and go, and history soon forgets them. Love is the nature of our reality, so love survives. The rest of it falls away. The rest of it, yeah, goes away. So that's the, that's the nature. So I guess to sum up some of the things we said is that intellect can get in the way. It can be a big help. But if the reason you want to go into those past lives and you want to go out of body and you want to do all these paranormal things is because you think it would be cool or neat or the information, I'd love to see what I did in the last, you know, my last incarnation. And why? Because you'd really like to make a comparison and see whether you're doing better or not. That's the main reason people want to do that. They want to go back and look and see, well, what kind of person was I then and am I making progress? So they want to give themselves a progress check. And they think, well, that would be a good idea. I could see if it, that's all just ego. It's all ego. You don't need a progress check. You don't need a gold star next to your name to make you feel good. Just do, be, grow, learn. You know, the rest of it is, uh, is just ego. They want to go find out things. So I want to go in that database and I want to find out this and I want to sit down and talk to this person or that person. Or, you know, get this kind of information. It's just ego. It's just because that would be neat or that would, uh, that somehow that's titillating to their intellect. But what's the value of that at the being level? How does that make you change? How does that make you be different? Well, for the most part, it doesn't, you see. So a lot of our wants, needs, and desires come from the intellect and from the ego. And the want, need, and desire for these paranormal things often come from the, from the ego. But that's not all bad, you know? A lot of people get attracted to the paranormal and then once they get here and realize that reality really is bigger than just the physical, they become seekers and look for something more. They're not just wanting to gain power to do this or that. You know, it's not a power trip or an intellectual trip or a gee whiz trip. They start to grow up. So it's not a bad thing. You know, these, these uh, paranormal things, it, it's, the, it's the, the sweet flower, it's the perfume that attracts but sometimes people just get caught up in it. It's not important for them to do that. They need to not get trapped in a paranormal phenomenon. Sometimes it's, it just happens to them. It just gets some, pouring in. Sometimes just it just comes pouring into pouring them whether in. they want it or not, That's like Bob Monroe. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> people will have an experience and unfortunately most of them immediately question it. Oh, I got this, you know, I closed my eyes and suddenly I saw all of these people and this was going on. And did I make that up? And rather than, rather than asking the question, should I believe it or not? They should ask the question, was there any value or not? You know, it's not, uh, you don't need to have other people or even yourself, you know, to, to decide whether you should believe it or not. That's the wrong, that's the wrong question. Going back for a moment to the potential energy, the, the beings that we are on a higher level. The negative beings that you mentioned, I think I might have asked you this before, but a being like Adolf Hitler, what process would that being go through having perpetrated the things that he did? I just got an email for that. Somebody did wrote to me really? and he said, uh, well, what about these evil beings? Did they get punished? <laughs> Do, the, do their victims get to, you know, get to torture them or punish them? And I could tell from the way he wrote it that he really hoped that that was the case because they certainly deserve it, you know. No, that's, that's all just ego, you know. That's not the way it is. Your, your punishment for making poor choices is that you've made poor choices and therefore you haven't grown. Your punishment is, is basically your lack of progress. You don't need any other punishment other than that. So you get somebody that did horrific things, like a Hitler, and there's lots of people that could go on that list, right? That uh, everybody picks on Hitler, right? But 
there's lots of mean people. It's just he made a bigger splash than most. You know, we could talk about Stalin or Mao, or we could talk about any number of people that are in Africa and and uh, and, uh, and in the United States and in every place, every other country of the world. Right? They're not local to any uh, particular culture. They're all over, and we could look at them as as uh, kind of evil people that did a lot of wrong things, hurtful things, things that. Uh, kind of drug us back rather than moved us forward. Well, it's not that there's a special little place in hell for them, you know. That's not the way it works. They regressed. They made poor choices. They lived from ego and belief and fear. And because they were in positions of political power, they made big messes rather than most of us who don't have a whole lot of political power just make little messes. You know, we anger our spouses and our children and our in-laws and our neighbors and that sort of stuff, but we don't, you know, blow up the world. You know, we have, we make smaller messes. But there's not a whole lot of difference there. There's many people who could have done, see, what Hitler did. It's not like there's only one or two people in the world that are that evil and sometimes they bubble up. That's just somebody who lives through fear, ego, and belief, who gets power. Well, now they get to exercise that fear, ego, and belief, so it affects lots of us. Many people would have not, you know, would have done similar things if they had the power. You know the old thing that says uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely? Well, that's the idea that anybody given absolute power would abuse it. If it's absolute, there's, there's no price to pay, you see. Well, it's not true to anybody. There are people that are above you know, that. But most of us, that probably fits, you know, that absolute power would corrupt absolutely. So here's a fellow who you know, lied and cheated his way into power. You know, he understood propaganda. He understood how you can, you know, do things to frighten people and then manipulate them through fear. And he did that, and he was successful in gaining lots of power, and then his, his fear and ego just uh, was spread all over. The, you know, that doesn't make him a whole lot more evil than many of us in the culture. It just made him a whole lot more powerful, therefore a whole lot more ability to express that in a big way. So what happened to him? No, he uh, would just have, like any of the rest of us, he would have to have taken his hits. He no doubt regressed in his evolution rather than progressed. And he now is in a deeper hole than he was when he started. He would have to start working you know, back out again. So it's not that, you know, big evil gets, you know, gets big, big uh, punishment. Generally, it's not like that. Though. There is no particular punishment. So I'm sure this guy that wrote the letter didn't want to hear that. You know, that's not what he, he uh, wanted to hear. <laughs> well, we've discussed a lot of subjects. Uh, mostly on subjective reality and our interpretations and how we can bring ourselves, lift ourselves up from our beliefs and bring ourselves into a bigger picture. So if you could leave one summary on a positive note of what, of what we've talked about, what would that be? Well, and, uh, I get asked that question uh, a lot at the end of talks. And what I generally say is that, and it's true, what, what can you do? Okay, here you are and you've listened to this and if any of it has made sense to you and you get some idea that maybe you ought to be doing something or being something that you're not, then that's good. You know, that's the first step. If none of it really made much sense to you, then it's probably because you missed the, you know, the 14 hours of explanation that preceded this you know, in a workshop someplace and that's why the concepts just kind of seem like they've been made up out of whole cloth here. But there, there is a lot more to it if you read the books or you know, do the, the whole workshops or something. You get a lot more basis for understanding what's going on. But it all comes down to you, to the individual. You 
are responsible only for you. Um, you need to get rid of that fear, ego, belief, expectation, and the way you do that is best is it to, to look for the ego. The fear and the belief are very hard to find. Most of us are driven by our fear and our beliefs, but those beliefs and fears are so ingrained into our sense of being that we don't notice them. We don't see them. They just are. We kind of define them as a basic given in reality and existence. We don't really think of them as being something that was overlaid on us. It's just part of us. So they're kind of invisible. And ego is much like that, but it's much easier to see. So I would suggest that if you want to grow up and you want to become more, and you see that there's really some point to your being here, and you want to take some effort to, to grow the quality of your consciousness, then look for the ego. And don't necessarily look for it in, in big dramatic uh, ways, just every little thing you do. Thoughts you think, if you feel angry, that's ego. If you're upset, that's ego. Okay. If something bothers you and you raise your voice, that's ego. So, if any of those things happen to you, you've, you've got a handle on it right away. If, uh, you know, if not, just look at your, your interactions with the people at work, with the people you love, your spouses, your children. Is it about you, your needs, and what you want them to do because you know it is right for them? You know, and some with children, you have to do that because you know, children aren't old enough yet to make a lot of their own decisions. You must prevent them from playing in the street, whether they want to or not when they're three or four years old because they don't know enough to get out of the street. So I'm not talking about that at that level, but in general, when it's about you, this is not happening the way I want. This thing at work is not going the way I want. People aren't seeing my work the way I want them to. People aren't giving me the appreciation that I deserve. All those kinds of thoughts, even if you don't call those anger or upset, it's all ego. You see? So look at the look at your thoughts and, and don't trick yourself by saying, Well, it's not really about me, it's about them. I'm upset because they're doing things to hurt them, you see. Uh, they're not they're not driving their car right. They're not being considerate of the rest of us on the road. You know, I'm angry because they need to change, you see. Well, this is your ego. Yes, they may need to change, that may be true. But what you need to change is your reaction to their need to change. You know, if it makes you angry, then that's ego. Or if it upsets you. So it's not just about them or others. Or, you know, I, I wish my spouse, you know, my spouse needs, you know, is not meeting my needs, right? So my spouse needs to change. It's that sort of thing. Well. You need to change. You see, you're the only person who can change. So if you're looking for how your environment and the people in it need to change to make you happy, all of that's ego. You're the only one that can make you happy. You have to change. If your environment is such that you're unhappy, that's your thing to change. Not your thing to change everybody else so it's the way you want it. And that's a tough medicine to swallow. But that's a fact. So if it's about them and about what makes them happy and about their learning and their progress, then it really doesn't matter so much what they're doing. You're there to give them support. And you're there to understand they're just doing the best they can with the way they see things. You need to build an environment that gives them the, the support and the confidence and the, the uh, I don't know, I, I guess the, um, the freedom to try new things, to be other than they are. If you stop trying to make them the way you want them to be and let them be who they are and then help them grow, not by telling them how they have to be, but by giving them an environment where it's natural for them to choose a better route, then now you're being helpful to others. And whatever their behavior is, is okay. Because you care about them and because that's them, and what you really want to do is, is help them out by giving them a better environment, not by telling them what to do or how to be or lecturing them. You know, that doesn't help. So change yourself and your world will become beautiful and you will find joy. 
joy is is in you know a life well lived. Happiness is the is the result of a life well lived, not a result of meeting certain goals, having two cars in the garage, hundred thousand dollars in the bank. You know that is not happiness. Happiness is a result of a life well lived. So that's that would be the last thing is do something about it. Okay, you've heard this. If it means anything to you, if you got anything out of it, then good. If you didn't, let it go. Yeah, you don't have to shake your fist and get angry of all those fools that say that you know these crazy things. Just let it go. That would show your own ego and your own beliefs and fears. So if you do get something out of it, though, don't just say, "Yeah, that's really good stuff," and then forget about it. Make a you know make a plan to change yourself, to grow up. So that's kind of the final words. Is, is you know, you're here to do something. You've got a you've got a mission to grow up, to evolve your quality of your consciousness. Go work at it. And you don't have to have a prescription. It's like, well, how do I do that? Just do it. Just start someplace and start with the ego. Catch yourself. When you see a little ego, then go back and say, well, okay, this ego is probably based on fear. Maybe on belief, but probably on fear. What's the fear? What is it not, you know, what, what's the fear? And then take the fear back. And the only way to get rid of fear is with courage. Accept the fear and then let it go. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Valuable as always. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Donna.